and different, as I said, different velocities, different types of particles. We did a part, spherical particles from generally rounded particles to highly aspherical particles that were of controlled shapes. And then we did lunar soil simulants also. And what we saw um, in this first uh, movie here, this is just a perfectly rounded particle or jet, pretty close to rounded particle. When you have a cratering of glass spheres, you're shooting this jet at a particle bed. You have, um, sorry. I think the movie doesn't work. It's slow here. Wait. I'm sorry, the movie's kind of, but, it, but, um, uh, you have two uh, features to the, to the crater. You have an inner crater that's related to the diameter of the jet, and then in the outer crater, that angle is related to the angle of repose of that solid particles, meaning it's the natural angle particles would make um, uh, with the surface uh, in, in a pile. And um, when particles are ejected from that inner crater, if they're generally rounded, they'll roll back down and fill up that inner crater. And so the, the inner crater is continuously being renewed, and that's not an issue, but they tend to refill the crater due to their particle shape. But when we talk about um, a lunar soil, this is a completely different cratering behavior. The crater looks like a scour hole. So these are uh, a lunar soil simulant here that we're cratering. So the walls are very steep, and that's because the stress is associated with that particulate material, given that it's very jagged. And as you can see, this crater shape is completely different than um, in the uh, rounded shape particle. Now, if we are going to try to simulate these two behaviors, um, we need to look at the types of modeling that we can uh, use to approach that. You can see that it's very jagged. Very, um, the surface has a lot of uh, asperities associated with it. The general bulk shape of the particle is not rounded in any way. And that's the kind of crater you get. So the first type of modeling that you could do if you want to simulate a large scale system is you could take a continuum approach for the particle phase. Meaning we can describe the particle phase much like we describe the motion of a fluid in that we need a description for the effective stress of that particular material. So the momentum balance looks much like the Navier-Stokes equation. So on the left-hand side, you have a transient convective terms. And on the right-hand side, you have um, the gradient of the stress of the solids. And the whole key to having this, uh, this kind of description be an accurate predictive model is how do you describe that effective stress in the particulate phase. And then the other term is the forces, other, any other forces acting on the particles. That could be due to uh, gravity, that could be due to drag, any other kind of additional forces on the particulate material. And I also should mention, and I, I neglected to say that up front, th this kind of modeling that I do is, is good for particles that have a lot of inertia. That is particles that are generally uh, solid particles that are generally visible to the naked eye, like one micron and above. Basically, they just don't trace exactly the motion of the fluid. So this is not a viscous dominated flow like a, a colloidal material. These are particles that have enough inertia to engage in collisions with each other. And um, so in those cases, when we describe the solid stress, we're using a granular kinetic kind of approach, meaning uh, we take uh, theories from dense gas kinetic theory and allow for the uh, nature of the particles, which are inelastic to be replaced with, um, to replace uh, the nature of the molecular collisions which are elastic. So um, there's a whole body of literature to describe this effective stress of the particles and it's used in a continuum approach. So we're, we're taking, it's called a two fluid approach where we describe both the fluid and the particle phase with this continuum approach. And um, this uh, movie that you're seeing here is the image just of a movie of a fluidized bed. So where um, the bubbles, we can simulate the bubbles, the gas bubbles, those are the blue regions, uh, moving through a bed of particles as gases, um, and you see the mixing patterns, um, and you can predict bubble shape and bubble growth and all those kind of things. So um, continuum approach is one way. However, the current commercial codes only describe the modeling, the stress modeling for spherical particles. So if we try to use something like 
fluent ANSYS to describe the cratering behavior that I just talked about, you can actually describe the rounded particle cratering behavior quite well. You get the inner crater, you get the development of the outer crater, but you are not going to, to predict a scour hole type behavior associated with a very irregular shaped particle. So for this reason, we need to develop an improved model for the solid phase stress associated with these aspherical particles. So we go to a new technique, the discrete element method uh, technique for simulating particles, where we describe the motion of every individual grain. So we solve um, F equals MA for every individual grain, accounting for all the forces acting on every particle, and then we have to do an accounting for the location of all the particles, their instantaneous velocities, and where the next collision pair between particles is going to be. So the forces that can act on the particles can be gravity, they are contact forces as they collide, there can be electrostatic forces, there could be liquid surface moisture. So uh, all we need is these uh, particle level models for uh, the, the respective forces. And then it's really, after that, kind of an accounting problem. Um, this technique is very good at getting the details of particle level phenomena. You can actually make simulations, which I'll talk about in a second, that you can um, derive what the stress would be for an assembly of those grains. Um, the only downside, really, of this technique is the fact that you can't simulate too many particles. But that's not really so much of a negative for two reasons. One, in some cases, you can simulate a small number of particles and still are representative of a large-scale system. For instance, if um, those storage containers for particles that I was talking about, you can simulate a very small scale uh, storage container, two or three inches, and that can be representative of a large scale industrial unit. In fact, in our modeling, we've reproduced the design charts that engineers use in industry using this discrete element method technique. Uh, the other advantage is you can do small scale simulations um, and, as I said, measure stress. And so that's kind of a multi-scale modeling approach, but we're not doing it dynamically. We're using the discrete element simulations to predict stress and then use those in a continuum-based um, modeling approach. So um, this is kind of the roadmap, if you will, of what we do in our group. We do discrete element method simulations, and we can set the particle shape. Uh, typically, we describe the shape of particles by linked and overlapping spheres to describe an aspherical particle. Um, we've done other kind of uh, modeling for shape, but that's the primary technique we use because the contact detection scheme is, is much quicker and efficient using that. Um, obviously, the, we can vary whether the surface is smooth or rough. Uh, the links between these particles can be rigid or they can be flexible. Um, the surface could be, have a surface moisture on it, so you could uh, have the case of liquid bridging. Um, and since the, these bonds can be flexible, if a force acts on a bond, uh, applied force uh, acts on a bond and breaks the bond is greater than the material strength of that um, material, then you'll, you would get a breakage. So we set the parameters of the simulation, the volume fraction, all the particle properties. We do the this discrete element method, um, and uh, we measure these particle-particle interactions, and we can relate that and predict a stress, um, a normal stress and a shear stress, and that is what is used in the continuum formulation. And then once we have all that data, we can either look for scaling relationships, which is nice, um, so we just can generate an analytical representation for the stress, or we can take a bunch of data and just fit that and, again, use those models into a two-fluid simulation. That's what this TFM on the right side. So the two-fluid simulations allow us to simulate larger-scale industrial kind of systems, um, more realistic domain. So uh, when I was saying we do these discrete element simulations and measure stress, how do we do that? Well, we typically do these kind of simulations where we have particles of a given shape, a given volume fraction, 
a given coefficient of friction, a given coefficient of restitution. We place those in a periodic, 3D periodic box. We apply a shear to those and um, we let that shear until the stress, the measured stress, reaches a steady state value. So the plot on the right is stress, uh, shear stress versus uh, shear strain, just a dimensionless time, and we wait till that levels out and we take that measurement of stress, and that measurement of stress at that volume fraction for that particle shape is what we would use in a continuum formulation. And um, when we're in dilute phase flow, these particles, in this case just cylindrical rods, um, move over all of their random orientations in a dilute phase. And disks, same thing, very uh, random orientations. And this particle shape has a dramatic effect on the stress. And when I say the word stress, I mean the flowability, essentially. So I'm talking about the effective viscosity of a particle mix. How easy does it flow? And that's going to relate to the cratering behavior and um, in the NASA applications and many other kind of, all those applications I uh, talked about in the very beginning of the talk. So um, if we look at the dilute regime, this is a plot of stress, shear stress versus volume fraction. In the dilute regime, that's this yellow region here, a solid volume fraction under 10%. Um, and I'm looking at particles, these are just for the cylindrical rods, of aspect ratio 1. I'm looking at uh, increasing the aspect ratio for the elongated cylinders or uh, decreasing the aspect ratio for the disks. What happens in the dilute regime as I go from a particle that's more rounded to more aspherical is the stress is reduced. And, um, and Actually, before I explain that, I should talk about why for a generally rounded particle, we have this kind of U-shaped curve. So stress is equal to momentum transfer. In the, in the dilute regime, the stress is due to particles moving from shear layer across shear layers. As they move through, so these particles are having a bulk motion plus some fluctuating motion. And the fluctuating motion is due to the collision. So when they move, um, past shear layers, that's a, a kinetic or translational contribution to the stress. In the, dilute, in the dense region, the stress is primarily due to solid body collisions. So you, you increase the concentration of uh, particles, you get increased collisions and increased um, stress due to the collisional contribution. So in this dilute phase flow, as particles become more aspherical, they're more likely, and, and they're I showed they're moving on their random orientation, they're more likely, if they're more aspherical, to engage in a collision with another particle. That is, the mean free path between collisions is going to go down. If the mean free path between collisions goes down, then their translational contribution is going to, is um, moving across your layers is going to go down. So increasing the asphericity decreases this kinetic or translation contribution to the stress. Now, if we increase the asphericity in the dense phase, what happens in the dense phase is we start to get ori a preferred orientation. Particles are not randomly oriented any longer. They tend to align in the direction of the shear, and we see that with disks and cylinders. This alignment actually makes it easier for particles to glide past each other. And so the flowability increases or the stress decreases with increasing um, asphericity. And we see that here on the dense phase, this pink region, the stress in general tends to go down. Now obviously if the, if the, if the surface is more rough, you will not see that, that significant decrease. If the per surface is very rough, actually the trend could be the reverse because you're going to increase your collisional frequency. But if in the case of a smooth surface and a highly elongated particle, you'd get that preferred orientation and the stress decreases because they become more flow, the flowability increases of that, um, that particle mix. So bringing this all back to the cratering. So this is a plot of the crater depth versus time. So um, just to give you an example of how what I just showed has implication in the crater depth, um, I'm just looking at some experiments here of three 
um, uh, shapes of steel particles. A steel cylinder of aspect ratio one, which is um, a small aspect ratio, but certainly not a, a perfect sphere. So we have a sphere, and then we have a cylinder of aspect ratio of eight. And so what we just saw with the dense phase flow, when you have an elongated high aspect ratio, a smooth surface, those particles tend to flow very easily. So what's going to happen is as they're ejected from that um, inner crater, they tend to slide down that angle very easily. So they're, they fill in the crater, and so their crater depth is not as great. And um, that's the yellow line. Same thing's true for the steel spheres. The one that has actually the highest crater depth doesn't renew and fill back along, um, uh, slide down that angle of repose line is the steel cylinders of aspect ratio one. So how the crater develops is intrinsically related to its shape and its flowability as it's moving down um, the sides of that um, uh, uh, second regime in that uh, crater shape. So we do experiments to validate all of these simulations. What we do typically for our experiments is we just use shear cell experimentation. Um, you could also use an FT4 rheometer to do um, validations of these. We place particles in a cell. We apply a normal stress. We measure the shear stress. Now, uh, these experiments are slightly different than the simulations I just showed you. The simulations I showed you are constant volume fraction simulation. So we place particles with a known fraction of solids, and that remains constant. In these simulations, we have a constant normal stress simulation. So uh, it's periodic um, left and right and into and out of the page. The top and wa bottom walls are now real walls with blades. Uh, so which you have in the actual shear cell. And so this is a constant normal stress. So as the particles are moving, the top wall is moving up and down. So the volume fraction is no longer held constant. But uh, these two simulations are related, and uh, you can equally set them up um, as easily using the discrete element. But these are constant normal stress. The other ones are constant volume fraction. So using these experimentations, we can validate the discrete element simulations that we've done a lot of that for many particles um, with wet surfaces, dry surfaces, a variety of shapes. Um, the other thing that we've done with, to understand particle behavior, I'd mentioned like biomass, so we've done a lot of studies of flow of biomass. And to do that, we looked at um, this bond between particles. When you glue spheres together to form an aspherical particle, we l let these bonds be flexible. So um, that means the particles, the constituent spheres that form a big, larger particle, which would, it's an agglomerate that describes an aspherical particle, um, those bonds can bend, and they can twist, they can stretch, um, and then all of that is owing to the forces that are acting on them. And the, the, the bending and the twisting is going to be related to a material parameter. It's not a... Um, you know, a tuning parameter. It's related to the Young's modulus and the shear modulus for that material. So um, you can um, input basic material properties into this, into these kind of simulations. Obviously, if the thermodynamic temperature changes, if you're coupling DEM with heat transfer, then your Young's modulus would have to vary with temperature. But these are material-based um, properties. These are not, there are no tuning parameters in these kind of models. And as I mentioned, breakage is going to occur when the applied stress is going to equal the strength of that bond. So um, I just show two examples here of using these kind of simulations and the kind of, I guess, interesting results, results that we wouldn't have expected um, that we saw. Um, this is um, some shearing of elongated rods. This is in that, um, uh, we, this was something we did for a validation study. It was a shearing uh, with a, t a, a fixed top and bottom wall. And we apply um, a normal force, and we measure the, the shear stress here. And uh, we varied. We kept the aspect ratio of these fibers at 9, but we varied uh, the bond bend bending modulus. So we varied how flexible this particle was. And we went uh, over four orders of magnitude of bond bending modulus. We validated with, like, rubber cords to more fishing wire to very rigid particles. And what we saw, we didn't really expect this, is that the shear stress 
did not vary with the bond bending modulus. That is not what we would have expected. Initially, I would have guessed that the more flexible the particle, the more easy it would have been to slide past each other, provided the surface was smooth. And in, in these experiments, the particles that we used had a very smooth surface, um, was not a rough surface. Um, but um, what happened was it was, um, it was uh, no effect. And what the reason for that was when we looked at the packing fraction, the solid volume fraction as a func function of bond bending modulus, as the particles became more rigid with increasing bond bending modulus, the, the volume fraction went down, so the particles became more porous. But with, um, and as obviously as we have these flexible particles, we had higher solid volume fraction. So we had a higher packing of the flexible particles, which basically counteracted the effect of um, the fact that they were flexible and could glide past each other. So these two effects, maybe fortuitously in this case, um, but they canceled each other out as we varied the flexibility of the particles and we didn't see an effect on the stress with the same normal load. And, I, and it was because of this packing, um, how they packed for flexible versus rigid. The other thing we've looked at is the fluidization, and this is where it gets into biomass operations. How easily are these fibrous particles fluidized? And how does the fluidization change with the flexibility of fibers? And um, so to describe these kind of um, the fluidization behavior, we used a CFD code to describe the motion of the fluid, in this case a gas that's fluidizing the particles, and the particles we treated with the discrete element method simulation. So we're tracking each, into ed, each and every individual fiber, and the fiber is described by um, linking these spheres together that are in flexible bonds. And the way we describe the drag force for this aspherical particles, we just basically had an additive effect of the drag acting on each of these individual spheres to describe the net drag on the total fiber. So um, it's a CFD, discrete element method simulation. And one of the things that we look at as, uh, uh, is the flowability and the ease of fluidization. So in this, um, I'm showing how the minimum fluidization varied with the fiber aspect ratio in this case. This is for a fixed bending modulus. So what we saw in that case for a fixed rigidity, this fairly rigid particle, that the, the fluidization, minimum fluidization velocity decreased and then increased. And that all has to do with how the particles aligned in the flow and what their porosity was in the flow. So when there was a low aspect ratio particle, the minimum fluidization. So um, with increasing aspect ratio, it went down and then up for a fixed bending modulus. For a fixed as aspect ratio, as we change the flexibility of the, of the particle, that continued to the minimum fluid veloci fluidization velocity monotonically increased. And then it's at a certain rigidity that stayed essentially constant. And this was all due to the packing fraction. The more rigid the particle, the, um, it, it packed less tightly, so more porosity, less, um, less drag force, and increase in the minimum fluidization velocity. And this has a lot of applications in fibrous material, any kind of fibrous flow, um, how the length of the fiber and the flexibility of fiber affects its motion. Um, mixing, any kind of mixing processes, um, the fluidization affects that. So um, uh, this is uh, a mixing index as a function of fluidization velocity. And we define the mixing index as we just define, we um, divided up this um, fluidized bed into two regions uh, of the particles. Um, and at the top region, we looked at what percentage of those particles were new, renewed as a function of time. And that was an essential. Um, 
how we define this mixing end index, what percent of the particles were renewed in the top section. And obviously, as the fluidization velocity increased, the mixing index went up. And the mixing index was the highest with this aspect ratio of two particle, and those were the ones that were the easiest to fluidize. So um, the kind of mixing behavior, the flowability, um, and like I said, has a lot of implications on many processes involving kind of fibrous materials. So um, a couple slides here to end this about um, what we're currently working on. And I think this is the whole key to the NASA project that we've been studying for a long time. We started out with, when we started the NASA pro project almost 20 years ago, there was nothing about aspherical particles. We, so we started with very simple controlled particle shapes. Now we're moving to more of the, the realistic shape. What I think is the key to the cratering, the very um, uh, high stress in the material is um, this mechanical interlocking effect associated with this very jagged surface. So uh, this uh, JSC1A is just a lunar soil sim simulant. And mechanical interlocking uh, can occur when convex and concave regions of different particles interact with each other, engage, and then when they interact, there's repeated collisions. They kind of lock in place. So this can occur at the level of the bulk shape of particles. Uh, so, you know, a concave and a convex region interacting at the bulk level, or even just um, at a small scale roughness or asperities, you can have kind of an interlocking effect. So, and mechanical interlocking um, so mechanical interlocking definitely mitigates the flowability because you have a locking kind of behavior. And I want to emphasize that mechanical interlocking is different than all these other kind of ways that would mitigate the flow of particles. Uh, if you're talking about cohesion due to van der Waals or cohesion due to liquid bridging or electrostatics, it's not that. It's not even due to surface friction. Mechanical interlocking and surface friction are not the same thing or just a geometric confinement of particles. Mechanical interlocking actually, even if you don't have any of these, no cohesion, no surface friction, no geometrical confinement. You can have mechanical interlocking, even under dilute conditions. And it depends on the shape. It depends on the orientation. If you like, look at these two particles, one is going to be interlocked. The other one will move past each other. So um, with highly irregular shaped particles, mechanical interlocking can play a big role. We're, um, we have a funded project right now looking at the asperities, surface roughness, so interlocking at the more small scale surface disparities, I won't get into that. Um, uh, we have m another project on mechanical interlocking to the bulk shape of particles. So um, uh, here we just took a very simple particle. I just wanted to do this first study to see how dramatic can this effect be in terms of the flowability. So um, we just took a simple elongated particle with five, made of five spheres, and we gradually curled that particle and looked at the interlocking. Um, basically, these particles with intermediate interlocking, if you remember that the monkeys kind of were <laughs> um, interlocked together, that's basically what we have here, and we're shearing these materials. And um, So we call them mechanical interlock when, um, if you look at these curled particles, the plane that's formed from that kind of C-shaped, that plane interacts the plane of another. That's an inter We call that an interlock. Um, so this is the kind of effect mechanical interlocking can play. This is a plot of the shear stress versus the volume fraction. And in the dense flow, up like 50% near, near um, close pack, uh, getting towards close packing. This is the shearing here. The stress can increase four orders, four orders of magnitude. This is a really big effect. And we've seen the same thing even with um, the roughness, that the stress increases orders of magnitude. So this is, um, the red here is just when you have a mechanical interlock. 
and we wanted to make sure that this massive increase in the stress was related to interlocking. Why did we see this? Because we don't see that with, it, with those um, uh, more controlled shapes that I was talking about, the rods. I mean, they increase, but we're talking or one order of magnitude, nothing like on this order. And so we looked at the histogram, <clears throat> the histogram of these interlocks. Um, so the number of interlocks as a function of their duration. And we saw kind of two regimes here. A lot of interlocks of short duration and then um, um, less but a, of longer duration. There's the two regimes. And um, these short duration interlocks are ones that just come in, maybe one or two collisions, and then bounce out. These other ones are the repeated, many repeated interlocks that prevent the movement and the gliding of one particle past another. And the total area under this curve is the total interlocking time. So we found that the stress did not co correlate with this total interlocking time. But once we removed those short duration interlocks, there was a perfect correlation between stress and interlocking time. So if we looked at just the long duration interlocks, the stress versus long duration interlock related, um, correlated very strongly at these high solid volume fractions. So um, we know that that is true, and we've checked that for the roughness too. So um, the interlocks are, are um, really the dominant factor of determining the stress behavior of these kind of frames. And um, anyway, I, I really appreciate your attention. I hope you've learned something new about particles and um, Discrete element simulations, tracking this motion can be used to understand a lot of particle behavior. And a lot of that particle behavior is how they pack, how they align, um, their shape effects, aspect ratio, uh, mixes of particles, and how they segregate. And you can also develop these closure models for continuum simulations using discrete element method simulations. So I really appreciate your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I hope All I right. went over. <laughs>
And then the binary mix, there was kind of an increase in the stress over the two monodispersed sizes. And that actually in that case, the size of the small particles were adhering to the larger particles and that was inhibiting the rotation of those particles. So it was inhibiting the flowability and that's the reason they got actually an, an increase in stress. So it can be a glider and it can also uh, it inhibit, longer. yeah, so it can have uh, both effects. Uh, great talk, Jennifer. Um, you mentioned <coughs> your students um, working in fluidization and in Bechdel and mm -hmm. um, Exxon. In fluidization, obviously, attrition resistance is a potential showstopper, or the lack of attrition resistance. Are you able to use this simulation approach to Yes, in, in fact, that the project that I showed with the mechanical inter interlocking with those asperities, that's actually the first part of a larger project. The next step is the attrition of those asperities. So um, we're just taking a base sphere and having little nubs um, uh, of different heights and different uh, densities. And um, if you make that bond of the nub with the larger, you know, a flexible bond and depending on the applied force, yeah, so you can predict attrition patterns. And we're, uh, the difference is in this technique, um, other modeling techniques when you would get attrition, um, those pieces were kind of neglected, but we keep that in our simulation. And our early simulation results showing that if you keep those fines in there, um, that actually mitigates attrition. It's kind of a cushioning effect. I think they've observed that in industrial practice. So the the presence, the fines that break off actually can help if they're not taken away, you know, in a bag house or something. But if they're kept in the process, it it would mitigate tends to mitigate further attrition. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely talk. Um, I think your results on Twitter, if I if I misstate this, please please correct me. <coughs> Oh, I just didn't show the normal okay. stress plots. I'm sorry. They, um, I was focused on the shear stress just because that's where, you know, we were having some experimental. But yeah, uh, the compaction effects is huge. Right. So, uh, um, yeah. What kinds of results do you see for shape and normal stress plots? Or what is the effect of shape on normal stress plots? So we did not make those measurements. Um, but yeah, depending on the gas velocity. Um, the normal stress can play a big role or not. So if you get such a high gas velocity that you start to get some compaction effects, then it's significant. But at certain velocities, it actually isn't as critical. There's regimes of these kind of creator, cratering depending on the gas velocity. But the higher gas velocities, it's a significant. about uh, elongated particles flow in a different context. Mm -hmm. It was about uh, oil recovery. But he studied the effect of shear and uh, differences in geometry and actual perpendicular stresses. And he also found uh, something that he described as a log jam. In fact, that's what I love in this work. The same way that logs, when they flow in the river and they encounter a narrow canal, such mm -hmm. a big jam, and the flow stops. Is this something that you saw, or is this a concern in what you studied? In, in yeah, we, yeah, you see that in, um, so we've done a lot of discharge of hoppers mm -hmm. with varying the aspect ratio. Oh, it's a huge effect, this log jam effect. Yeah, so um, it can, high, highly uh, elongated particles can easily clog the opening of a hopper and affect the flowability of the, dis the, the discharge rates. And those were keeping the effective volume dying. A lot of these correlations for hopper um, discharge rate that folks use in industry are based on the equivalent volume diameter of the particle. So when we did our simulations and our expect experiments, we kept the equivalent volume diameter the same. And yes, obviously for rounded particles, those things work fine, but same equivalent volume diameter elongated 
it will jam. It jams in the simulation experiment. Yes. Oh, yes. I didn't emphasize that. I'm sorry. Yes, so the, the kind of what you probably would have guessed, the ones with the intermediate degree of curl um, had the most interlocking. What we're trying to determine right now, we're trying to relate the size of that opening because that's going to have um, implications to when you just look at a, a, a mix of particles, how easily one uh, interlock with another. So we're looking at the that opening and seeing if we can relate that to what is like an optimum or I guess suboptimum opening for um, uh, op for the interlocking to occur. So the ex actual shape feature. Always see the two linear, and yeah, it varies with, with the, um, with the uh, this opening. Yeah, so when it's um, when it's uh, you know like more like this, a very wide opening, we only see a little bit of the long duration, because most of the collisions are, they'll come in by the way we've defined interlocking the, that planar region, they'll come in and bounce back out. Yes, yeah, so the, the drag force is in, in there. Um, and yeah, drag actually for aspherical particles is still a very strong subject of, <laughs> of research investigation. Uh, typically, people will take um, the drag for a single aspherical particle and then just multiply by some volume fraction effect. So um, we didn't want to do that in these simulations, so we, we our fibrous particle was built by these single spheres, so we just added the drag for each individual sphere. Um, we could have used one of those correlations, but that's the way we ended up describing the drag for the aspherical particle in that case. No, um, no, I know I don't. Maybe uh, if you've done that, I don't know. Maybe you're referring to some. No, there was there was not in that case. No. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yes, comments. Yes, so these, these two fluid models are in commercial codes, um, and uh, a lot of companies have in-house two fluid model codes where, you know, they're describing their, their fluid phase and then their solid phase with a continuum. And in fact, uh, one of my former students worked for ExxonMobil. That was his first job for four years. He, he did these two fluid method simulations, design a pilot unit that they were interested in with, and you can combine those with thermal energy and reactive equations. And then after four years now, he's building the pilot plant and running it. So yeah, people use this now regularly in, in um, uh, many industries for design and optimization for troubleshooting. It's a, it's a common practice. 
very important. Understanding their uh, their behavior is critical. Uh, these models, though, that I'm developing are more are actually not as applicable to nanoparticles, just because um, these models are more of a, like a, the inertia dominated flow. So um, where their flow behavior is completely independent of their medium um, that's driving their motion, flu a flu any kind of fluid. Um, so it's more of uh, the stress models that we're working on are um, more con based on collisions and contacts between particles. So it's, um, it, but the discrete element could be used for nanoparticles, but the force models would need to be altered for the nanoparticle system. Well, we appreciate your fantastic talk. Thank you. Can you change to the first slide? Of course. I think it's uh, in recognition of our, of our extraordinary contribution in engineering education and research. Thank you.